Hello, everyone. It's me, Man Alone, and I'm your host, uh, Man Alone. And we're back. I'm so excited to be back because we're talking Dragon Bane. Now, if you've been following my YouTube status updates, which I assume you have, I assume that you have it set so that whenever I make an update, your phone uh, makes a loud bullhorn sound or plays shipping up to Boston from Dropkick Murphys. Um, but in case you haven't, uh, my statuses have all been about how hype I am on Dragon Bane. I know I'm late to the party, nine or ten months late. This is truly my style, right? I'm the kind of guy that watches, you know, the show that everyone tells me to watch. I watch it six years later. I say, oh my gosh, can you believe what happened in season three of Breaking Bad? They say, man alone, I haven't watched that show in six years. I don't even remember what happened in season three. It's fine. And maybe we need this, right? Because after the initial excitement about Dragon Bane, um, we want to keep the party going. And so you need some schmucks like me that will roll up uh, almost a year later to say, hey, does people want to still talk about this? There's really no better way to get uh, YouTube views than talking about something that was um, uh, that came out almost a year ago. I don't care. I'm not in it for the views. I'm in it for yous. Oh, Lord. Okay, so here's the deal. Um, we're going to talk Dragon Bane, and um, I'm going to tell you why I love it. And we're going to set up some solo play. And we're going to do some solo play. Now, I have uh, tried to make this video twice. And uh, I it didn't work. And the reason it didn't work is because originally my intention was to get you uh, up to speed on how to play Dragon Bane. And then get you up to speed on how to play Dragon Bane solo and then play solo. And I would get done with the how to play Dragon Bane part. Uh, I was literally going through the rules and uh, and this is how thick that rule book is, which it's a very uh, concise rule book, but it would take me about an hour and a half. And by the time I was done with that, um, my, my inner ears would honestly be congested from talking so much. And so I kept running out of steam and I wasn't even through the whole rules book by that point. Um, and so here, here's what I think we're going to do instead. And, and please don't ask me to post those videos because I deleted them out of shame. Um, rather than me going through that, if you want to learn how to play Dragon Bane, go ahead and look up one of the 900,000 how to play videos. Um, most of them with an extremely soothing German accent or Swedish. Um, and th there really is that many. I mean, um, there is every time over the last nine months that you have sneezed, uh, uh, 7,500 Dragon Bane videos were uploaded. So I'm not going to add to that. I'm not going to add to that stuff that's already there. Instead, my goal is to get you playing some solo Dragon Bane. And that means Yes, you, the one who watches all the solo RPG videos and says, shucks, I should really do that. And then you don't. I want you to play this because I think this is such an incredible RPG. And let me tell you, that is where I'm going to start with this, is I'm going to talk about what I love about Dragon Bane. Then we're going to go over the solo rules roll up a character. I already rolled up a character, but I'll just give you a little bit of insight on how that went down. And then we're just going to play. Um, and I, I, I haven't played yet. Um, and so I'm going to, it's going to be raw. It's going to be fresh. There's not going to be any, um, you know, virtual tabletops. I'm going to show you everything I'm doing in front of me just so that you can imagine what it will look like as you are, you know, playing your solo game, uh, in your, you know, whatever den of solitude you spend your time in. Okay. Um, and, and that's going to be the plan. And I actually would like to, uh, make a campaign out of this because, um, I think there's big things on the horizon for this. I think there's a lot of people who are very hype about this game as well. I think everybody who really gets into this sees something special here, like I did. 
And so I, I think this is the wave to ride on. And so let's get ourselves up to speed. Let's start playing. Let's be ready for the things that are coming down the pike. Okay. Um, before we do that, I just wanted to give you a little bit of a preview of some things coming down the pike for this channel um, before we begin. And I just want to say, um, I, in addition to like having several false starts on this video, also had a couple of things delaying my production of the videos. First of all, I got a new computer, uh, which is like not, <laughs> it's not, it's not like I got rid of my old one. So it's not really an excuse, except, um, I have been trying to, uh, get, you know, the video recording software and all the, um, hardware, camera, everything working on a PC after working on a Mac um, before. And so that has caused some logistical issues. Uh, and then also I was waiting for a new, um, I can never figure out what to call this, like a camera mount, um, because uh, you wouldn't know this because this is like a little bit of behind the scenes. But the setup I had before, uh, it was this sort of bendy, uh, grip thing that I would I would put the camera on and it was very flimsy and so I'd have to get it just so and it was too close to the to the playing area here so I had to stack it up on textbooks every time and it it was it was creating a big barrier to entry to making videos because every time I thought of making a video I'd go oh lord now I have to do all this stuff with the textbooks and the bendy thing um, so I got a, a much better rig here now, which is making it a lot easier. Uh, hopefully, again, I'm, I'm sort of optimizing my lighting setup. Um, and so we'll get better at that. And so that, that was a new, new computer, new arm thing set up. The other thing I, I you know, I just have to be straight up with y'all is I have been so invested in writing my RPG. The last video that I made was another update on it. If you'd like, uh, please take a look at that. Give some ideas. I've already got it. it, it I, I'm not going to beat it in the ground. It blows me away. The kind of like thought uh, that people put into the feedback for that. It's got so many good ideas. And I really do feel like we are close now to a point where I can play test that um, for all of you, I think there's some really special things uh, that I have come to in that. I feel really proud of it because it's like every development in that game has been really hard one of me um, just working through the process, seeing what works, moving forward. And, and boy, howdy, did it help to get some feedback from all of you as well. Okay. And I love it. I just love it. I, I, I sometimes I, I write it till four in the morning, you know, and I know that that's sometimes not healthy, but there's just not. Uh, there's not too many things in life that, that make you that excited. And so when one of those things happen, I just, I can't help it. I just have to ride that wave. Um, because I, you know, I love it. I love it. You know, it, even if I never publish it, even if it never is played by anyone, I just, I love doing it. I'm so happy doing it. Okay. And so, yeah, I have to admit, like I, I've wanted to make these videos. I've had a couple false starts. And then so many times I was like, I do want to make the video, but I just want to keep working on this thing. I would think about it all day. All right. That's out of the way. I do have to brag about this. Um, my partner for anniversary got me this card holder. I'm using it right now for the Dragon Bane, beautiful Dragon Bane dice. And I just have to show this off. It is laser cut with man alone. It is... Uh, the best gift I've ever gotten. Uh, so thank you for uh, that, Miss 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 Alone, Miss Man Alone. Um, and okay, so that's that. Um, the other things I just wanted to say some other uh, things that if you're interested in, we might also have uh, a little something, a little side quest. Uh, I recently got my Carved by the Garden. This is by Cassie Mothwin, and I kickstarted this quite some time ago, so I was very happy to see it in my mailbox, and I got that really special Kickstarter thing where you sort of like forget that you had <laughs> ordered something, and then it just kind of shows up again. The art in here is gorgeous and dreary and scary and beautiful. Uh, I am curious to see how the mechanics of this game go. Uh, it has 
uh, more, so one of the things, boy, I really, there is a, a certain uh, solo journaling, solo author specifically, and I, I don't want to be negative about someone, but I really have had a sort of disappointing experience with, with other solo journaling games that are sort of of this thickness and of this type of paragraph block texting where it's been basically you're buying a game and it's just telling you to write stuff you know and it's it's like I, I don't know this feels like homework so I'm, I'm excited about this the art alone makes it worth the, the buy but also um it looks like it has some more at least some mechanics okay and and that's all I asked for um it looks like it has some dice rolls uh, it does have this Jenga, it's, uh, I don't know if you're able to call it Jenga, but this tower system that I don't love. Uh, I don't really want to get involved with that, but I'm sure we can figure out some sort of mechanic to, to do that. In fact, I think there's some like alternate uh, options here because it is based on the uh, Wretched and Alone system. Uh, but yeah, if any of you are interested in this, maybe we could do a side quest, take a look at that. Looks like it has really good writing, really good art. So it's and again, it's just really pretty. So Cassie Mothwin, amazing uh, job with this. This looks great. Uh, the second thing, I think it's been out for a while, but it finally got printed. I have a copy of Dead Belt, which I think the print copy became widely available on October 30th. I could be wrong on that. Um, but this is, uh, this is really interesting. It's by a couple of Drake's games. And um, this is... Uh, this is interesting, and this 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 is already in the short time I've had Dead Belt RPG for Space Cowboys, which is it has a solo and duo version in this. In the small time I've had it, I just love when there's an RPG that brings some really different stuff to the table, and especially as I'm developing my own RPG, it's exciting to have some different mechanics to kind of make me think about different ways I can do things, and something I'm, I'm particularly interested in this game is you you know you have this spaceship you do ship creation you have sort of a debt system and you do these uh, salvage jobs which I can't say uh, whether we're like salvaging them or robbing them since it's a cowboy game I don't know but either way the way that you set up the ships is through like setting up these cards and then flipping them and discovering what's in each section of the ship and I just think that's so cool and it has really inspired a lot of good ideas in terms of how my RPG is going to go. We have playing cards here for some extra uh, uh, randomness and different inputs and mechanics. There's co-op mode, rival mode, and solo stuff. So if you're interested in that, maybe we take a look at that. And then this one is not new. I've had it for a while, but I haven't played it. This is Forbidden Psalm. It is a miniatures compatible game for Merck Berg. Um, and if you don't know what Mark Borg is, then I don't know what to tell you. Uh, how was the coma, I guess, that you just woke up from? But um, so this is not made by the Mark Borg, uh, uh, like Johan Noor, and uh, I'll think of the other person's name, but um, Johan did, Johan. Uh, did do this art, contributed this art, which I thought was really cool. And it's a miniatures-based game. It is very on, um, it's very on point on theme for Mark Borg. Kind of this mixture of salvaged, uh, found art, um, uh, very concise directions, reliance on the intelligence of the character, or I'm sorry, the player, you. And the other thing I recently noticed was that in every one of these campaigns, there's like a little directive for solo play and co-op play. Uh, it's not much, but it's enough just to give a little bit extra customization so that you can adapt it to solo play. And what caused me to revisit this is the fact that there was a cryptic tweet by Space Penguin Inc., uh, announcing that there was going to be some sort of collaboration between Forbidden Psalm and Statuesque Miniatures, which I hope you know about Statuesque Miniatures, but in case you don't, um, they are some of the cutest, uh, most well-made, most like want to paint the crap out of them miniatures. And they're doing a collaboration with with 
uh, like a forbidden psalm thing. And I don't know. I mean, the the, the statue miniatures um, person does some other stuff. So I wouldn't, it may be like something that looks like this. But I am half hoping or I don't know if I'm hoping, but it would be interesting because I would love to see like this versus the, um, you know, sort of uh, main component of the Statue of Miniatures line, which is these cloth goblins. <laughs> <laughs> let me try to get a good zoom here. Uh, here. Let me bring a light just a little here. Uh, yeah, so these cloth goblins, look how cute they are. And they're so nice. Um, they have such a nice weight to them and they're metal and they're just begging to be painted. Um, and uh, we have, of course, Mr. Swither. If you're someone who loves to paint miniatures, these just like, I can't explain to you the joy of having this in your hand. Now, like, I won't lie, I'm a 40K. Uh, I love the miniatures. There's some, you know, that's fun. And obviously, Inquisitor Grayfax rules, but there's something about having this kind of metal here that's really, really wonderful. Uh, and so, I don't know, we'll see what the announcement is, what they do, but either way, maybe we'll take a run with Forbidden Psalm. Uh, I must ashamedly admit that I'm a little bit um, intimidated by uh, miniature play. Um, you know, I've watched me, myself, and die play five parsecs from home. Obviously, I'm a huge Warhammer fan. I love to paint the miniatures, but I've never played a uh, Warhammer uh, miniature. It's just not my interest. Miniature gaming doesn't seem like something I'm too interested in. It seems a little bit like freeform chess with me and the idea of like measure measuring taping things while you're playing. And and you know, to be honest, I am just a bit intimidated by it. Um, it just at times I've gotten the impression that it might be a little difficult to to penetrate that that scene um, and I got into it when I was a little bit older so obviously I have some reticence towards that even though I'm sure I can I can find my people and and they'll be welcoming I just never had that strong of an urge to do it so this though made me for the first time think hey what the hell if we could play a solo game we could use these cute as hell cloth goblins um, and this, this person is just the bomb. Uh, and so from Scotland, I hope we can do something and, and why not, you know, let's throw some, throw some miniatures down, do some, do some war gaming in the Morkborg, uh, universe. So again, if you're interested in, in seeing any of these or heard any of these or want to see some solo play in these, drop a comment. Um, yeah. So let's get back to What's at hand? Let me pause for a second to just clean all this stuff out of my area. Okay. Let's talk Dragonbane. So I don't know why I had a resistance to Dragonbane for so long. It, it, it wasn't, uh, you know, an acrimonious feeling or anything. I, I didn't feel negatively about it. It's just I was always like, ah, I don't know. And looking back... Uh, how humiliating because there were so many pieces there that made sense. But I, I think it's because I'm just sort of worn out by sword and sorcery. Um, my 5e uh, playing group, you know, I've been GMing that. I'm a little bit worn out by that. And I'm more interested, as you could tell from, from the campaign videos I did with like 40K, Star Trek Captain's Log. Um, and so I resisted it. Um, but... I did end up, you know, having like a little bit of, I give myself a little monthly RPG allowance and I had a little bit of money left and I had about $50 uh, set aside and I see the Dragon Bane starter kit, which is this uh, cardboard box, really nice looking. And, you know, I just pick it up and I can't believe it at my friendly local game store is actually $44. And so I was like, well, hell, I mean, if I'm looking, you know, I'm comparing that to some other solo RPGs that I have in my hand that are like pamphlets for $40 versus this box, which has so much in it that I was like, why the hell not? You know, let's, let's give it a shot. I get home and I'm just in love. I'm like in love with this thing immediately. Um, 
and I can't stop thinking about it. I can't stop reading about it. Uh, this is actually, I didn't, this is not in the box set. This is the quick start guide. Uh, I actually bought that afterward because I am now, uh, if you've been reading my statuses, I'm now like a waging an open campaign to get my 5e group to convert to Dragonbane, which is a little bit slow going. But I got this just so that I can give them this for reference to take home and read about it. I wanted them to see just how easy it is, just how beautiful it is, just how uh, well made it is. Um, and w if you were to get this quick start guide, which again was like $7, it has enough in here for you to run a one shot. It has some pre-made character sheets that you can make a... Um, copies of it has like all the rules you're going to need for exploration combat it has an adventure in it uh and so i th i think this would probably be if you're like a little bit on the fence go ahead and get this free league it's awesome um so so let me just say the two things though that were like staring me in the face that i'm like kicking myself for taking so long number one the art in this is the same person who did Vazen which is another free league that deals with like Nordic mythology. I want to just give credit where credit's due. It looks like that's Johan Egerkrans. And I love it. The art's awesome. This is so interesting. A mallard is one of the, the kin in this game, which is sort of race. Um, and, and all of the art is just, uh, it's incredible. Uh, one of the things you get in the box is this map of Misty Vale where like the universe exists of this game. And look, I'm going to sit here and rag on the world's most popular role playing games because obviously there's something really great about them and they walk so we could run or whatever. But sometimes maybe you vibe with this. Sometimes you're looking at a cover of one of those player's guides, best Jerry's, game master's guides, and you don't register it as art in the same way that you register this. This is touched by human hand. This is special. Those other things, you kind of look at them, and because of the company that's behind them, you might say, uh, you know, mages on the border or whatever the company might be called. You look at the, You look at those and you just see marketing, whereas this, you see art. And it's filled with this kind of stuff. And then you flip this thing over and you look at how many backers there were. I mean, statistically speaking, if you're watching this video and alive, you were one of these backers. It's wild. Um, and so that's the first thing that, you know, the art was by somebody I already, it just, their art I already adore. Uh, and then the second thing is the, the included solo mechanics uh, alone in deep fall breach one of the pers uh, the two people responsible for this is Sean Tompkins who did iron sworn iron sworn delve starforged <laughs> which is like some of the first like long solo campaigns that I've played using that system it's such a name and you know this is yeah it's a 12 page thing here but this is like in addition to the 112 pages of rules that you get with the game. And so this is like a really good solo play guide, super taut, uh, super um, concise. And so I'm thinking to myself, what the hell was I doing? What was I delaying? And, and it really, I think, was that fatigue with this kind of setting. And I'm just thinking, oh, I don't want to get into another thing. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to like, you know, get into another pathfinder type situation or whatever, where you're just kind of learning a game that's similar, but a little different. And boy, am I, uh, am I eating crow? I'm kicking myself because I truly love, I truly love this. And, uh, I love it so much. I got my GM, uh, uh, screen here. It's got some really cool stuff. I'm going to put that up just for to help me out with some of the stuff in solo play. This does not come in the starter set either. Just got that. You really see my embarrassing glare of my uh, my little TikTok lights there. Let me try to set this up. Uh, actually, I'm not going to torture you with that. One second. Do a hyperspace jump. Okay, that was a lot. Took a lot longer than it should have. 
Um, so that the the GM board did not come with it, but what did come with it is uh, the rule book, this solo supplement, this awesome map, a bunch of um, pre-rolled up character or uh, player character sheets with pictures and descriptions on the back, um, five double-sided uh, blank character sheets to fill in. And I'm actually kind of treating myself now because normally I, I never touch these. I always keep them to make copies of it. But I actually wrote on the sheet. I know that's like anathema for some of you. But I, you know what? I just wanted to do it. I got four other ones that I can make copies of. I want to see what it feels like to really treat myself. Um, that's sad that that's a treat. It also comes with this adventure book. It's going to have 11 adventures. Again, really well made, glossy, super well written, great pictures. It's just so neat. So many good tables in it. And then the last two things are the the, the, the true delights. This is just the uh, what I'm going to use for my um, journaling components of this. Um, so two things I really love, and, I, and I'm surprised how much I love them, is number one, it uses these stand-ups, and these are so, first of all, they're so nice and well-made. Second of all, I just haven't used these in so long. I forgot how clever and fun they are. Um, and in addition to you know, your characters, they give you two of these boards with monsters and NPCs and playable characters. Um, and so I just love that so much. And actually they're, they're kickstarting right now. Um, looks like they're going to have a, a bestiary with a hundred new entries. And I think they're going to have some new, uh, standups that come along with that. Obviously it came with a bunch of these so that we could actually stand them up. Um, so I love that, uh, the dice I really love because once again, um, a little bit weird, but something I love, you know, this might look like the standard set, but the way that they've incorporated the crits. Okay, so uh, in this game, you know, you have your stats, 3 to 18. Rolling under the stat on D20 is a success, equal to or less than. Rolling over it is a fail. And so the higher your base stat, the more likely it is that you're going to roll under it. And so the, the, the crit success roll is actually a 1. And in this game, it's called a dragon. And the crit fail is a 20, and that's called rolling a demon. And that's, if you didn't know this, sort of the original um, name for this game, which was developed in Sweden in 82 because they, they didn't have D&D translated at that time. It was called like Demon and Dragon, Dragon and Demons. Uh, because in this universe, like the dragons were the good force of good and the demons are force of bad. Um, but what I love about the dice is if you roll this really good um one it's called rolling a dragon and they like incorporated that design into the one and then i think even more clever rolling the 20 you roll a demon and i just love how it has the picture there but you could still read the 20 look i know it's a little bit geeky but think about when you're rolling these um a d20 that little moment of time that electrical flicker in your head right if you were to like slow that down what you're really looking for and what you want to, you, you know, that, that moment when they stop and your brain is processing what happens, if you're able to do that a split second faster, you're able to see this or you're able to see this, I think it just heightens the, the drama of it, the delight, the disappointment of it. So I just really love that. Um, I, I, I don't know why. I just I feel so connected to this game. Uh, and the last thing is this quality of life thing is these sets of cards that they include. And oof, maron, do I love these. So um, we have four different decks here. We have an adventure deck, which has like some stuff in each of the adventures to give us like a little background, a little story we could put out on the table. 
Uh, it has initiative, one through 10. And the way that uh, combat works in uh, Dragon Bane is, you know, you, one could be good, right? You, you have the first move. Um, but if you're playing against a monster, because most enemies are NPCs, monsters are these really big bads. You know, they're, they're sort of like, this is a monster here. That's a monster. Whereas like, you know, you face like a goblin or something. They're, they're called NPCs in this game. When you're facing a monster, they have a, a ferocity score. And according to that ferocity score is how many of these initiatives they get. They might get three or four attacks, right? The reason why sometimes you don't want to be this one, or if you get this one, you don't want to go, um, is that it might pay off. Uh, you know, battle is very kinetic in this game, and you can parry. And if you parry, then you flip your initiative card, and you can't make an action the next round. And so it could behoove you to wait to see what the monster or enemy does so that if they attack you, and it could be pretty deadly in this game, if they attack you, you can do a parry roll or a dodge and use up your action. You won't be able to attack next round, but you'll be able to move, you'll be able to do free moves. Um, and you know it, it will have paid off more than kind of getting out ahead, doing an attack, and then the next round you're just completely vulnerable. You just have less choices. So there's some really cool strategy involved in that. And really, again, just from a quality of life thing, when I'm DMing, I don't know why. I don't know if anyone else has this, but I just hate rolling initiative. It's so annoying sometimes. I feel like I'm hurting cats sometimes, especially with a big group. I feel like people forget their initiative. And then there's that moment sometimes I forget my initiative and I say, okay, how about you? And they say, oh, aren't you supposed to go next? And I'm like, Ugh. yes. And then, you know, have to deal with that little tiny humiliation of being a DM, <laughs> just with a barrage of humiliations. Um, uh, that's not true. It's very good. Very honored to have that role. Uh, so that's really good. Love how that works. And you redeal the initiative every round. If you had to roll every round, that might be onerous. But with this, just put them back in, shuffle them up, draw the initiative. Love this treasure set, right? So again, you win a battle. I don't got to look it up. I don't got to try to figure out like balance, how much money they should have at the time. I just say, yeah, congrats. You got some loot. Pull a card. Well, you got found a poison dagger sick all right what else gold ring worth 46 gold coins awesome what else got some copper coins 10 copper coins is one silver 10 silver is one gold and that i think is just so handy i just wish every game had that um because again as a dm sometimes especially when we start going off the the script if if such a thing could be said obviously there is no script but if if the characters are really going far afield you might end up you know creating a lot of encounters on the fly and then you know having to figure out the the correct loot for that and everything it's just it would be really nice to have that deck uh and then this is perhaps my favorite thing now let me say that this battle mat that they give and it's kind of two-sided. This one's like an outdoor, and then under it is like a you know an indoor dungeon main. It's just a simple half battle mat. Each square is uh, two by two meters of in-game space. Movements determined by what kin uh, your character is, and it just has just enough space to handle a simple battle, whatever you need. And they have this um, these this deck of improvised weapons from three different biomes, forest. Um, it could, it could be from the forest. They could be improvised weapons from a cave or it could be from even an inn. And these are just lying around. You could throw them around. Uh, you can, you know, I guess you could put actual cards, although it takes up too much space, but you might take like a coin or a die and say, all right, there's one here and there's one here. And then as your characters use their move to go get it, all right, see what you got here. You got a patch of dirt, and then it'll tell you, throw dirt in the eyes of an enemy within 10 meters, they get D6 damage, armor has no effect, um, and then they get a bane on all actions for the rest of combat. That's great. Um, that's, that's unbelievable. You pick that up, you use it, it's consumed. 
I think that makes the battle so much more engaging, you know, and they're not all like just, you know, it's not all just like pick up thing, throw there's wasp nests, right? So you could use different skills, hurl it at the enemy. Um, they have one, I, I think I could find a chandelier or boiling cauldron. Um, let's see the chandelier swing yourself from the chandelier and perform a melee attack. You can take a normal movement action without triggering free attacks. The melee attack must be unarmed, but cannot be dodged or parried. Um, so these just add this like extra element of really being able to um, place things around the theater of the mind uh, in a really effective, easy to follow way. And so for all these reasons, I love Dragon Bane and I want you to play. And I think, like I said, there's there's going to be there's going to be more and more stuff coming for this. I really feel like there's something special about this game. I think it behooves you to get on board now and and enjoy the ride, um, because I think we're going to be getting a lot of third party stuff. We already have some stuff coming out on drive through RPG. Um, and I think this could be something that that really sticks around. I, I certainly hope so, because I think they did a great job with it. OK. So, all right, what I'm going to do now, I'm just going to put some stuff off to the side here so that I have access to it. Um, we're going to go over the solo pamphlet, talk a little bit about the character I rolled up, and then we'll set up the campaign. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk through the first steps of that, see if we can go any further. Um, I'll actually keep both the rules and this quick start guide handy. Although once you read the rules, a quick start guide could be a little bit limited, but it's nice to, to pop it open every once in a while. If you, especially if you maybe have a table that you want to go to in there or something, maybe I'm talking, talking out my rear end. Do they have tables in here even? Um, yeah. So, uh, could be, yeah, they got some, some, um, some monsters in here, some spells. Um, yeah, so it could be could be helpful. Anyways, um, all right. So let's talk alone in Deep Fall Breach. So I'm just gonna have my journal here to the side. I don't want it to get in the way, but you know we're solo gaming, so we don't know when we're gonna need that. Okay, make sure I don't collapse that into our field of play. All right, so Alone in Default Breach is the solo dungeon delving uh, campaign. And the way that this is gonna work, it's gonna be kind of a recursive mission in which you're getting micro missions from this guy who is called, I'm never able to pronounce the name, but his name is Ingufer. <laughs> I'll just read this, The Chapel and the Wolf. The nameless chapel stands at the edge of Deep Fall Breach. The mortared stones of the structure have stood fast against time, wind, and calamity, but its stained glass windows lie scattered in shards, and the heavy oaken doors hang loose and creaking on ancient hinges. You are caught amid a torrential rain, so you slip inside, eager to escape both the downpour and the baleful red glow emanating from the depths of the breach. Inside, the chapel casts a shadow of itself, rotting pews, piles of refuse, tattered tapestries depicting battles long forgotten. Candles lend their meager glow in flickering clusters while fragrant, fragrant smoke curls from the incense burners. Maze-like etchings litter a large desk occupying the far wall. Maddening, aren't they? The gruff, weathered voice precedes a hunched form dislodging itself from the shadows. Silver streaks the coal-black fur of a wolfkin draped in ratty road, robes. And just so we know, wolfkin is one of the races or kins in this game. I think it's another one that's really cool. And I think they're coming out with a cat one too, which you didn't hear from me. Um, I have just in one of these pre-made sheets what a wolfkin looks like. Really cool. And, um, you know, they're, they're, they're sort of not what you'd expect. You'd expect them to be like infuriated melee. They're, they're sort of wise and can be magic users. Um, 
and are, are noble, so I, I like that. Okay, silver streaks the coal black fur of a wolfkin draped in ratty robes. He leans on a wicked looking two handed mace topped with a clenched steel fist. Numerous scars mark the wolfkin's lupine visage with a stone sphere replacing his left eye. The breach, he continues, nodding toward the desk littered with labyrinthine maps. Impossible to map with any accuracy. He introduces himself as Stone Gaze, though he also supplies his true name, Inglefur. The name is not unknown to you, but the Inglefur of whom you've heard tell is a fearsome warrior and famed hunter of demons, not an old hermit priest. Have you come to delve the breach? He asks. There's good to be done, justice to be dealt, and riches to be uncovered if you've metal for it. So, we have Inglefur, Stone Gaze. Stone Gaze has not always stood vigil over Deep Fall Breach. Once he was Inglefur, a tenacious hunter of demon kind whose great mace, Fiend Breaker, felled scores of lesser demons. Inglefur's unending crusade brought him to Misty Vale, where he resides within a nameless abandoned chapel and keeps watch over deep fall breach with his enchanted eye. So this is this is uh, this uh, uh, form follows function here, right? We we have this this uh, Inglefur who actually um, I originally chose this, um, but I actually would like to see if we can get a wolfkin that might fit the bill. Let's take a look. Wolfkin. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm. Well, we have a wolfkin here, but I'm not quite certain. Yeah, actually that might work. Let's try that guy. I'm I'm in like new car mode with this, and so every time I take something out, I'm like carefully putting it back, and in like six months this stuff's just gonna be in a Ziploc bag. Um, but let me let me stay in this place for a little longer, please. All right. So we got Inglefur, and let's put Inglefur on a stand. Yeah. And we'll keep these handy just in case we see any NPCs or, or um, people we gotta get into a little scrap with. And I, and I wanna say once again, if you're solo playing, this is a, this could be a deadly game, you know, it, like my starting HP for my character is nine and we're alone now. And so we got to make smart decisions. We, you know, this isn't going to be something where we run into the battle uh, hooting and hollering. We, we have, might have to measure some things. So this is Inglefur and uh, some stats movement 12, which is, goes by his kin. My movement, for example, is eight because I'm a mallard. Damage bonus is strength plus D4, no armor, HP 16, willpower 14, skills listed here, awareness, healing, myths and legends, eagle eye, veteran, and weapons are fiend breaker, which is skill level 16, damage 2D8 plus D6 damage to demons. So uh, dude's got some firepower here. And you'll notice again in this game that NPCs are usually going to get somewhat of a roll up because... Um, enemies are NPCs and unless they're the big bads. And so, you know, you might be talking to somebody, things go south, they want you to prove yourself to them, etc. So they, they get a little bit of info like that. And it looks like Inglefur Stonegaze here is looking over this breach, deep fall breach, and has some missions. And as it was said, um, there's good to be done, justice to be dealt, and riches to be uncovered if you have the metal for it. Okay. Legend tells of a wicked wound in the world struck by demon lord Sathmog's spear, deep fall breach. The perilous depths of the breach plummet leagues into the foundations of the Misty Vale, comprising rough-hewn passages, echoing caverns, and ancient ruins. Okay, so... Basically, this is a big breach. It's going to be the, the launching point of all that we do. And what I was talking about with form follows function is that, um, you know, we are solo playing. So we need some way 
to know a little bit about what is happening on these missions because um, we're going alone, you know, and so technically it's like there should be no details. And if there's no details at all, then creating these missions is going to be a bit harder. If you've played um, Star Forged, Iron Sworn, you know that lots of tables and stuff, but even with those tables, the fact that there is no sort of like core um, narrative examples or, or procedurals because of that, you can get into a place where you're like getting a little bit uh, exhausted with generating all this stuff. The way that missions go in this game is you're going to have, you know, the threat, which uh, every time we take a little bit too much time or we advance or whatever, we're going to advance this threat die up by one. And then when it hits six, we'll face that threat. So that'll be another way to kind of punish us for bad rolls or whatever. But because Inglefer has this stone gaze, this eye that can see into things, he'll be able to tell us some things that are ahead, though some of the things are going to be unknown. All right. And that's when we'll be able to use uh, oracles to fill in those spaces. But uh, it's really just great whenever a game has this thing where the, you know, it would be one thing to just say, yeah, some of the details are known, some of them are not, but let's situate it in world, okay? So we got this old badass who used to just wipe out lesser demons like it was nothing, older now, a uh, little bit uh, grizzled, but has this eye now and is able to see things uh, that that could be possible. Um, and so, okay. So we're we're th this this deep fall breach is going to be kind of this this point of us to keep going into and going to different missions, right? This is our this is our vice city in our <laughs> in our G GTA. All right, and so there's five of these missions for us, and I'm thinking we'll play these together, you and I, um, over the next few campaigns, and then by that time we'll have a sense of how these go. And then I'll start making some missions based on that. But it's not just Deep Fall Breach. There's also a town nearby, which is the outskirts. And if you'll indulge me, I actually want to see on the big boy map here if we're actually able to tell where this might be. And if not, we can kind of just uh, uh, maybe we'll take that opportunity to place it somewhere on the world map just in case, you know, if we build this thing out more, we know where we are. So basically it's called Default Breach. We know it's in a, do we know it's in a mountain? Legend tells of a wicked wound in the world struck by the demon Lord Sathmog. Spear Default Breach, uh, the, the, they plummet leagues into the foundations of the Misty Veil. All right, so the Misty Veil is a whole thing. But they say later that the town nearby is the outskirts. Ah. Very good. Okay. So on the bottom of this, excuse me, the bottom of this map here, we have the outskirt. And so if we are looking to do some dialoguing, some going to the store to buy stuff, maybe, um, you know, comp making, bringing some complexity to this, then it's likely that this deep fall breach is somewhere over in here because I don't see deep fall breach on here, which I don't, uh, it's, I don't hold that against them, but um, yeah. So we'll just say it's somewhere in the, in the, the middle south uh, area here by outskirt. Oh, you know what it could be? I wonder if it's that. What do you think? That could be, right? Let's get a little more. Yeah, could be. Um, all right, well, we'll, we'll, we'll keep an open mind. So we can go to that town outskirt to... to um, get a little more information, meet some people. Maybe at some point we could play with two. I can have like sort of a, either a familiar or another adventurer that has like some simple attack methods or, or we'll see. Maybe I'll be able to, to do two at a time. Uh, here's what's different from the core Dragon Bane game just to make it playable um, as a solo player. Because right, if we're, if we're gonna play it straight up, it's gonna be really hard. You're gonna die really fast. So uh, it says, alone you will traverse the depths of the twisting caverns and crumbling ruins of Deep Fall Breach. Choose your kin, profession, attributes, and skills with this in mind. Also consider your motivation for coming to this dreadful place. So let's take a little break here for just me to tell you about the character I rolled up. 
So hello, say hello everybody to Grotty Flagstaff. Grotty is a mallard, all right? And I, I you know, <laughs> it's a very weird experience for me. I would keep seeing this and I would be like, oh, for God's sakes, like this is like Darkwing Duck or something. I mean, I hate these like cutesy little role-playing games, but every time I'd see it, I would be like, Dude, that picture is not tongue in cheek. That's like straight up badass. Like this guy is ready to do some serious, uh, give someone the emperor's piece here. And so, um, I just want to read these. Uh, my kin is the mallard. The origin of the mallards is shrouded in mystery. Some scholars claim that they came from a mighty island realm that was swallowed by the sea thousands of years ago. Others believe them to be the result of a failed magical experiment. Whatever the truth may be, these feathered humanoids are a common sight in the world. They have a knack for trade. Their agitated quacking is often an integral part of the soundscape around marketplaces and trade caravans. However, some mallards seek their fortunes as brigands, pirates, and mercenaries. Despite their diminutive size, they are fierce in battle and feared by many the murderous rage uh, for their murderous rage i love that right how easy would it be to make this thing into like this little comic relief but no if we're gonna do something let's do it let's lean into the truth of this world uh these these dudes are have murderous rage um they are shrewd in the marketplace uh and also you can hear them quacking all over the place which is kind of fun um has some uh, names. I took the first name, Grotty, and then I looked at the other possible names and I came up with the last name Flagstaff. At one point, it wanted me to roll a nickname, but I was like, why don't I see if I can find a nickname on my own? They, uh, the Mallard starts with two uh, innate abilities, uh, Ill-Tempered, which costs three willpower points. They tend to have a choleric temper. You can activate this ability with no action when making a skill roll and get a boon to the roll. You also become angry if you're not already. This ability can be used for roles against intelligence or intelligence-based skills. Um, the other ability is well, webbed feet. As a mallard, you get a boon to all swimming roles. You move. You always move at full speed in or underwater. It's an example of stuff you'll see on like the Reddit and other message boards. Sorry, I can't get a great angle on this. Um, they'll say things like, "Oh, you know, I was playing and." Uh, you know, I decided to like modify webbed feet so that uh, when they do a kick, you know, or something, it's going to add D6. And it's like, and they'll say, because it really doesn't compare to like the innate ability of the human or, you know, it's just is not fair that they have this one and somebody else gets, you know, magic or whatever. This is the point is not balance. The point is not to like create a fair game. This is not fair. Different people have different attributes. They have different heights. They have different skills. So we're going to focus on getting the most out of the skills that we have rather than being like, well, it's not fair because you think about any like adventure, you know, um, did anyone say like, hey, Frodo doesn't have, uh, we should give Frodo something like Frodo should have like turbo speed uh, so that, you know, he uh, can keep up with, um, was the strider or whatever it's like no 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 the what is it ranger i forgot the king um it's like no it's different things they have um this unassuming nature they have multiple breakfasts they are they are sort of targets of fate like fate conspires for hobbits but we don't need a hobbit to also have super strength right and so we want to bring the best out of these characters the class I chose was a little bit different. It ended up being similar to other things, but I just wanted to play something I don't usually play because usually I find myself playing like a paladin, a uh, cleric of some site, uh, a fighter, a mage. Um, and I was like, I'm going to try this artisan because they've got some really cool, uh, um, what would they be called here? Professions in this. Mariner and merchant. Talk about unbalanced scholar, thief. As part of a group, I think this makes sense. It'd be a little bit difficult if I try to do a scholar on my own. I did an artisan, all right? And this is basically like carpenter or blacksmith or tanner. Um, it ended up being kind of like a fighter anyways. You know, their key attribute strength. I rolled for their loadout. I got like a hand axe, leather armor, carpentry tools, torch, rope, flint, tinder, 
food rations, silver. Um, and you know, that's fine, but I like that I got these carpentry tools and I decided for my heroic ability to start with master carpenter because it gave me an option between that blacksmith and tanner. And since a uh, master carpenter requires carpentry tools, I said, why the hell not? We already have these. And so what that will give me is the ability to, um, do some big damage against, uh, doors at least, I think maybe all inanimate objects, uh, and ignore their armor. And, uh, you know, we have good, good, rolled out some good stats for, uh, uh, Grady as well. Um, even though strength was the main thing, just with the adjustments, he's old. So he had a lot more skills. Uh, we got a lot of, a good diversity of skills here that are kind of, you know, up, upgraded, um, spot hidden languages, healing, uh, awareness, axes, hammers, a lot of weapons, we have ill-tempered, webbed feet, master carpenter, three silver, leather armor, which will only give us a one protection, but doesn't encumber us. Oops. No helmet. Uh, my memento is a letter from Aunt Spacky. I thought that might be a good duck name. And, uh, yeah, so this is my, my encumbrance is five, and I have a hand axe, which is a one-handed. Boy, I wrote really light just because I was in, like, gonna erase mode so let me try to get a good angle here so you see this um sorry about that let's see okay well i'll just read it uh one-handed grip uh strength is uh, the range is equal to the strength if you're gonna chuck it although uh, we'd have to retrieve it damage is 2d6 durability 9 that's if you do an attack and it doesn't even clear it doesn't clear the armor enough to do damage it'll uh do like could break or need repair, which again, being an artisan is going to be helpful in that because in a shift rest, we can repair it. And uh, we have some toppling, slashing, and throw abilities added to that. Um, and then because it's solo play, you're able to add one of these solo heroic abilities. I think it's obvious which one, if you've seen these already, um, you know, they're both going to be helpful, but truly army of one here is really the one to go with when fighting alone draw two initiative cards and keep both the other one i could choose was soul survivor which is uh i can push my role without suffering condition which which will be you know useful and i hope i get a chance to level up and get that one but for now we're going to add army of one just because otherwise i don't know i don't really know how i'm going to get through any battle all right uh, as an independent hero, you gain one additional heroic ability or choice at the start of play. Thus, non-mage characters begin with two heroic abilities. Uh, mages, of course, begin with magic, and so they don't get a heroic ability, so they would just have one, either Soul Survivor or Army of One, or, or you could choose any other one uh, that makes sense. Um, but, I mean, I can't imagine not picking one of these to start if you're playing solo. If you, have a, a, if you could think of a reason why or one that would stand out, let me know. Um, two new heroic abilities for solo characters are included to the right. These may be selected during character creation or when earning a heroic ability through play. So we did Army of One. We have our fortune chart. We have our inspiration table, which I'm really looking forward to using because it's simple. And, you know, Sean Tomkin here. This is this is great. We got some dragon and demon effects, uh, which I also I'm I also really wish there was something like this in Starforged. I just feel like a lot of the time that I'm playing that game, I'm spending so much time figuring out like the yes, but, or like the, uh, I forget what it's called, but like I'm constantly losing roles and then having to like suffer some consequence. And, and I mean, in some situations you can roll 10 times, you might roll, you might fail on six of them. It's like, I can't think of six consequences. Um, a simple NPC template, a fortune chart at the bottom here, just to answer some basic questions. I'm actually going to move this just so I can bring it a little bit higher, y'all. There we go. All right, should have done that a while ago. So dragon and demon effects, right? And anytime I roll a dragon and demon, I'm going to be able to put a, a check on my character sheet, and then we can roll at the end of the play session to see if we... Uh, scale up any of those abilities this is an npc attack table um for monsters we're actually probably going to be referencing uh their entry here 
you know, to actually see their specific attacks and rolling on that table. But for NPCs, this is a real great table. You, you know, what are they doing? Are they melee attacking? You roll 1d6, ranged attacks, sneaky attack, magic attack. Um, some different things here for resolving failures. In solo play, you decide the consequences of failure. Consider the situation and introduce an outcome which creates new complications or hardship but does not block the way forward. For example, uh, you make a persuasion roll to gain the cooperation of the leader of an orc clan and fail. The orc doesn't flatly refuse. Rather, they insist you must first face them in a duel. Um, so, so I guess what it's saying is, like, if possible, let's instead of some no's, let's do no buts. You know, let's find a way that because uh, that's another thing that could happen in solo play. You're like, okay, can I get this person to come with me? No. Okay, could I bribe them? No. Okay, is there anyone else here? No. And you're like, okay, well, I guess I'll just drink some milk and go to bed. Um, so different options here for that. Uh, combat. So I think this is important to know. And honestly, a lot of the examples of online play that I've seen so far solo have not heeded this advice. And as my intention here in this campaign is to empower you to pick this game up and play, I think this is important to read. I don't think people want to believe this. Combat is tough for a solo adventurer. Avoid combat through negotiation, guile, or subterfuge if possible. When forced into a fight, use special attacks and heroic abilities to your advantage. If you gain the upper hand through tactics or terrain, award your character a boon. If all else fails, and the fight turns against you, flee. I'm not kidding. To prepare for this video, I probably watched 10 videos of either a full solo play or just like a couple solo scenarios. I saw, I think, more than half of those people die in the first fight. They, they rolled themselves up a monster. It was way too much too soon. They didn't use terrain. They didn't leverage initiative, and they just got smoked, right? And they had to like re-roll characters up, which... I think if you're doing solo play and you're trying to show people how to play, I don't think that's, you don't probably have to do that. You know, there's some points where you go, yes, I understand the mechanics said that, but uh, veto, right? Anyways, uh, just some guidance for just suffering damage in general. You get your foot stuck somewhere. Healing, so a little, um, a little bit wider possibility here for the solo adventurer. Uh, as a stalwart solo adventurer, you may make a healing roll to tend your own wounds during a stretch rest. On a success, heal 2d6. Attempt to rally yourself while at zero HP without a bane to the persuasion roll. And attempt to save your own life with a healing roll while at zero HP. Okay. We talked about this. It's like the intro. We have the missions. Go into the breach, you descend into a crumbling staircase into the chasm, braving the dizzying heights. A twisting corridor leads from the cliff face into the heart of the breach, emerging into what Inglefer called the vault of many paths. Yes, of course. Anything that's sword and sorcery has to have many things. Um, here lies a great confounding hub of passages branching from an ancient spherical chamber, its walls embossed with primordial uh, Battlefields depicting dragons and demons clashing eternally in stark relief. Innumerable tunnels run from the vault like veins through the stone flesh of the earth. Okay, so again, we're in this central hub. has a lot of doors. It's going to have all our missions. We have five of them written out for us. Let's see if we can get a handle on this so that we can create some of our own missions. Maybe even, I don't know, maybe, maybe expand this outside of the breach. Okay. Um, navigating waypoints. Play out missions within the breach by focusing on key locations, dangers, or encounters. These points of interest are your waypoints. Some waypoints are described by Inglefer in his rundown of a mission. So that is like when we're looking at a mission, these are the waypoints. All right. And some of them are unknown. Some of them are described. Some of them he can sort of see with his stone eye. All right. Some waypoints are described by Inglefer in his rundown of a mission, while others remain a mystery until you investigate them. A waypoint might detail a single notable space or passageway or describe a larger section of the breach. For each mission, progress through the waypoints in the order described in the mission summary. Imagine your approach, the details of the area, the dangers you face, and the opportunities you uncover. Resolve any questions or challenges at a waypoint before proceeding to the next. <coughs> If a waypoint is unknown, 
or you want additional detail, use the fortune chart and the inspiration table. I'm very much looking forward to doing that. Again, I think this is good. Um, I'm, I'm excited to see if this was going to cover what we need. I, I have a lot of faith in it, despite its small amount of options. Um, I think we'll be able to build some stuff from here, but we'll see. We'll see how that plays out. I'm curious because usually those are D100s. I don't know if that's better or worse, to be honest. I'd maybe split the difference and do a D66. Um, okay, since your expeditions... Um, oh, sorry. The places and passages between waypoints offer nothing of note and can be ignored or summarized. We'll try to summarize them when we can. Since your expeditions into the breach are abstracted, you don't need a map. However, a simple outline or flowchart of waypoints marking down important events or findings will prove helpful. We got our journal here for that. The final waypoints your objective. This is where the fate of the mission's uh, decided. All right, this mission threats, I like this. So we got our threat. It's gonna start at zero. I'm not finding a great place for this. I keep getting booted around a little bit. There we go. Um, a threat represents a looming danger, such as an environmental hazard, pursuing foe, or time limit. Each mission summary includes a description of a threat, and you can introduce a new threat in the midst of an expedition if you learn of an imminent peril. It's good to know. To track a threat, use a D6 as a counter starting at 1. If you suffer a significant delay or create an opening for the threat through inaction or failure, rotate the die to advance the threat by 1. In dire situations, such as when rolling a demon on a time-sensitive task, advance it by two. Since the dangers of the, uh, danger the breach do not wait, you should also advance the threat if you divert from your mission for activities such as searching an area or resting. While the threat advances to six, the event comes to pass. You must face this danger or complication head-on. If the threat is inherent to the mission or the nature of the region you're exploring, it should reset to one. Um... If not, remove it from play. <clears throat> to keep the pressure on, maintain an active threat whenever delving into the breach. If you want inspiration for a random threat, roll or choose below. So we have some threat ideas if they're not added to the mission, but let's, let's take a look at those, just a few of these, just so we can start teaching ourselves how to make these missions. One is a dreadful creature has your scent. When the threat triggers, it attacks. That one I feel is most obvious. Two, this region is prone to tremors and cave -ins. When the threat triggers, you face a catastrophic quake. So we'll probably have to do some checks with that, agility, acrobatics. Uh, or maybe we'll have to find an alternate exit. Uh, a known enemy seeks you out. When the threat triggers, they catch up to you. A vile corruption persuades the place. When the threat triggers, you're exposed. This one's a trap. Ghostly whispers. When the threat triggers, you face a harrowing manifestation. Leaving the breach. If the path back to the chapel is clear, you may retreat from the breach without incident. If the way is fraught with dangers, roll awareness or sneaking to see how you fare. Uh, I just want to take a just a brief aside here to say the, the menu of skills, of basic skills in this game is one of the most attractive things about this game. The fact that I can look at my character sheet and at any moment, uh, I know everything that's open for me to do. I know all my options here. Right, because it's what the hell happened to my character sheet? It's right in front of me. All my options are right on this sheet. I guess I'll just use this one just to show you. This is what I can do here. Right, these secondary skills, you know, right now those are just magic, but they said that those might, you know, I think as they expand, uh, maybe if there's something that's akin to a druid class, we could have like. Uh, wild shapes, stuff like that. Um, but yeah, it's like at any time I have ratings for all of these things. So what do I want to do? Look it up. It's right here on the sheet. I love it. I love it. Love it. Love it. Okay. Uh, however, I do not love the fact that I seem to have misplaced my damn character sheet. Uh, and now I have found it. My little sheep has come home. Okay. All right, here. Uh, uh, to see how you fare. If you fail, you must first overcome a danger such as an ambush or environmental peril at one of your previous waypoints. If you're not sure what you encounter, roll on a table for inspiration. 
now I like this because sometimes I'm going to want to get back and sometimes I'm going to have that feeling that I have or what I tell my players when I'm playing in um, um, group RPG play, which is like play where you're at. Like when you get to the next place, there's just going to be a next place to get after that. Explore this space. You're not in a hurry. But sometimes I will be like really excited to advance the story or whatever. And so it's cool that as long as you're unimpeded, you can sprint back. Uh, roll D4 plus 2 to set the number of waypoints you must traverse to reach the surface and generate those locations using the procedures described on page 8. That's the next page. Gaining experience as detailed in the rule book each time you roll a dragon or a demon when using a skill, tick the checkbox next to that skill. Okay, so whether it's a crit failure or crit success, we check these and uh, then we roll a D20 on them and if, you know, say that we got an acrobatics check, which is four. We roll a d20, and if it comes up, <laughs> if it comes up higher than that, actually, I believe. So this would actually be good. If the result exceeds your current skill level, it is increased by one up to a maximum of 18. So I did roll a 20, um, and I don't think that Bane's Boons, Dragon's Demons apply here. It's higher than four, so I don't raise it to 20. If it's higher, I raise it by one. Then I erase the tick for next time. And I can try to raise it by one each time, but I have to roll. And it'll get harder to raise it after a while, right? Because if my acrobatics, I get it all the way up to 17. When I roll on this, I'm gonna have to roll higher than 17 to get it up one. And that means I have to roll an 18, 19, or 20 and math. So um, I like that system. And it whenever we roll a, dream, a demon or a dragon on any of these, Additionally, because we're solo dolo, um, we also get to choose just five to try to roll and increase every time we're done with a mission as well so that we can bring some things forward and have more of a chance of survival. Uh, make your advancement rolls between missions. So those are rolling the d20 to try to get higher than this. Roll those between missions. Uh, if the result exceeds your current skill level, it's increased by one up to a maximum of 18. When you're done, erase the marks and start over in your next mission. Um, and addition gain okay yeah and it says uh so check next to whatever a uh, dragon or demons rolled and it says in addition gain five advancement marks for skills of your choice when returning from a successful mission this alternate reward replaces the standard system of advancement at the end of a session in group play as is standard when you increase a skill level to 18 you gain a heroic ability of your choice so that's cool so that's how we get some more Heroic abilities, and two of them, one of them, Robust, I think it's called, I could be wrong. There's two of them that permanently increase your willpower and your health. Um, but, you know, I, I do think my health points being at a nine are going to have to be a priority. Willpower is at 13. Maybe we can get that if we, if we get a lot, if we go along a while. But I'd be giving that up in lieu of some other heroic ability if by then I have a lot of good armor. Who knows? I could be in a way different place. Uh, taking a break if you want to resupply, upgrade your gear, or socialize with someone other than Inglefur. The village of Outskirt is a short journey from the chapel. And, you know, I bet dollars to donuts that Inglefur... It's about to be a disaster of things falling on the floor here. Waking up everyone. Please, Lord, do not let that happen. Uh... So, uh, oops, wrong one, rules, I need adventures. I'm just trying to see if we have maybe any info on outskirts in the adventures book that we will be able to refer to. Please be an index. If not, that'll be a, oh, okay, good. Uh, nothing, I'm not seeing anything. Outskirts, ah, uh, seven, nine, 14 to 27. Hell, yes. I was actually looking up Inglefur, which I doubt that this wolf guy would be in here. So let's see what this town looks like. But we're going to get a lot of good stuff here. Yes, we are. Awesome. Here's Outskirt. Let me bring this over. Outskirt, awesome map. Um, different areas. Armed villagers, different NPCs. Maybe this. Maybe we can try to recruit. See how if we could figure out how to do that. 
Um, if you're if you're playing this, by the way, you know, plug your ears or whatever. I don't want you to spoil anything. But these are the different locations, different NPCs that can be encountered. Again, all with some stats. And it's just this is just like anything else. Like you know, some like if you talk to a person, you'll find out what they want there. Uh, but this is really good. This is populating this outskirts so that we have some stuff to do here and can expand on it. And then these are random encounters around the outskirt that can be rolled. Oh, this is so exciting, guys. This is so exciting. Um, great. More random encounters. More random encounters. We are in business, friends. Yeah, so this is this is awesome. So we'll have a lot of fun with this. We can we can expand this. I I um I feel good about and what the hell do you know? I don't know how I'm gonna do this without hitting the uh I don't know if you could see this. <laughs> Lord in heaven. Deep fall breach. There it is. I was right. That's deep fall breach. We got our map. Let's try to make this big. I want to try and make this big. I want to try and go further. You know, I want to try to do more than just, um, hey, solo role playing is fun. You could play this one mission. It's like, no, man, I want to, I want to play. I want to play till my guy's dead. What would that look like? Okay. All right. So we have some possibilities there on outskirt. We'll keep going. Um, Generating custom missions. We'll have to we'll have to do this as we go forward. Uh, this adventure includes summaries for key missions, but those are not your only forays in the breach. Craft your own using this procedure. Set your objective. Create details uh, for Inglefer's foreseen waypoints. Add unknown waypoints and set a threat. Keep your mission outline inspirational but vague. Inglefer's vision is far from precise. Uh, yeah, so I think we'll we'll go back to that when we're ready for that. Now we have some exploration tables. These look good. I looked over these. These look really good. Location details. Um, you know, you're going to roll a D4 on these. And then you have sub tables over here. So two, uh, environment. And then we have this sub table, which is D21. And we roll a one, bubbling pool. All right. And then we have contents, environment, oddity, danger. We don't probably have to. We could probably do this manually here, but this is just to populate a space. We could see if there's inhabitants here. We can see what this place is. We can scavenge. Uh, and then of course we could use the inspiration table, which kind of forms a sentence structure. And we can say, oh, what's, why are we going on this mission? All right, this is uh, 1D20. So we do action, then attribute, then thing. All right, let's just try it as an example. Five, destroy. 10, flooded, 17, resource. Okay, so, you know, the first thing you do with that kind of thing is you you, you allow yourself to consider the different um, conjugations of each of those words. So maybe we're not destroying a flooded resource. Maybe a flooding is destroying a resource. Um, maybe we need to rescue a very important resource before it's flooded that resource could be a person that resource could be a resource it could be that there is something that is very lucrative to the people's survival and without it the town's going to starve um so that's that's how we can you know it's how we can get shaken and bacon we also have this sub table here get some information about what's going on in each room scavenging and again we find any treasures or anything we just look them up right in there you starting to see it here starting to see it and with this we probably wouldn't want to put an inhabitant like in every room i mean i don't know if we'd want to fight like a demon in every room this might be we might use this differently based on what what we're trying to do here search table so if you want to do a search, you do spot hidden. Searching. When you carefully inspect an area for hidden doors, concealed mechanisms, or other secrets, roll spot hidden. 
Taking the time to search is risky. It requires a stretch and any active threats advance. So once again, this stretch thing is just a amount of time. A turn is 10 minutes of in-game time. A stretch is 15, I'm sorry. A turn is 10 seconds. A stretch is 15 minutes. And a shift is six hours. Okay. Um, searching. Taking the time to search is risky, requires a stretch and any active threats advance. So we would put our threat cube up one if we decided to search. I like that, I like that. That's a great cost mechanism. We roll a dragon. We can roll Tice on the table to the right, which has like two different concealed foe, trap, secret path, hidden antechamber. Uh, yeah, okay, I don't need to say that. And then traps, the breach is riddled with deadly traps. Now traps are always a little bit tricky to do in solo play because he, <laughs> uh, as, as he pointed out on me, myself and die, it's like, I can't create a trap that I don't know how to disarm or I don't know where it is unless I was like made the trap and then like rammed my head into the wall. And so I, the way that we play that has to be more like a skill check of spot hidden and a little pro tip actually to DMS out there. It's actually better to do clues and stuff like that anyways. Like, tell your players where the trap is. Let them role play the avoidance of it. But, man, is it such a waste of time, just tedium, to be like, oh, there could be something in the room. Walk over here, okay? Walk over here. And sometimes they start looking for this trap. Uh, anyways, sorry. Um... Uh, as both the GM and the player of your adventure, yeah, it says right here, you may occasionally have knowledge of a peril that your character does not. If the trap is not yet sprung, you spot hidden to stay out of trouble. If you activate the trap and can respond, make a roll such as evade. If a trap causes you harm, check the damage table. It's coming together, everyone. See this? It comes together. We can check our damage right here. How bad's the damage on that? Okay. Oh, I miss scavenging here. When you ransack a cache of abandoned supplies, dig through the nest of a slain creature, examine the gear of a fallen enemy, or otherwise scrounge for loot, the scavenge table to the right can reveal what you find. Use this table for rummaging. Does it put up our threat? If you're broadly searching an area, use the search table on page 10 instead. Good to know. Scavenging does usually not require a skill roll and should only take a minute or two. That's good. So we probably don't have to advance the threat. But if we scavenge more than once in an area and we get a little greedy, then we can, we'll, we'll be honest. You know, that, that's a big part of solo play. We have to keep the, the reality intact, even if it's going to bring threats to us. Uh, all right, we have traps here. Cool. Flaming spout, shooting arrow, spitting blades. Teleporting sigil, which would unleash a new waypoint. Interesting. So then we begin on these missions, and that's where we're going to pick up next time. So we're ready to go now. I'm going to keep everything ready to rock and we're going to um start with uh the captive orc okay and um really you know maybe we can come up with something after we finish these and we imagine something maybe we can come up with something that i can actually just write up in a pdf and put on itch or something like that so that other people could explore it as well I want to thank you for coming along this with me. I'm so happy to be at the end of this video. I can't tell you how discouraging it is when you're recording three and a half hours of drivel only to realize you got nowhere. Um, There's so many resources to learn how to play Dragon Bane, and I think it's a, it's a, it's a it's a game that's easy to pick up. You know, it's not simple, but it's 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 intuitive. There's an intuitiveness to it that I really like. So we'll, we'll put that to the test. We'll come back with the captive orc. That's going to be our first mission. Um, please, if you can, drop a like and subscribe if you want to see any of those uh, games that I put out there at the beginning. Let me know if those any of those pique your interest. Otherwise, thanks for coming along on the journey, and we'll see you soon. Boy, am I ready to sleep.